It's the Motley Fool Money Radio Show. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me in studio this week, senior analysts Jason Moser, David Kretzman, and Ron Gross. Good to see you as always, gentlemen. Hey, okay. Good to see you. We've got the latest headlines from Wall Street. We will dip into the full mailbag. And as always, we'll give you an inside look at the stocks on our radar. But we begin with the market's wild ride. On Wednesday and Thursday, the S&P 500 fell more than 5%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost around 1,400 points. Everyone was freaking out, Ron. <laughs> Friday morning, the bleeding appeared to stop, and the market bouncing back a little bit. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah. How'd you do this week? You know, <laughs> stop me if you heard this one before. These things happen. <laughs> We're at, a, at the at the end of a nine-year bull market. We've got extremely low unemployment, high GDP, low interest rates for, for forever, right? Really long period of time. At some point, folks, inflation ticks up, interest rates rise, stocks correct. It's actually quite healthy. It might be painful, and no, hey, listen, I don't like to see my stocks go down, but it's actually quite healthy. If you don't panic, you stay the course, you think long term, you can actually benefit from it. Yeah, Jason, there's uh, around the office this week, there's been a lot of uh, quoting of uh, David Gardner, co founder of The Motley Fool, who said, remember, Markets go down faster than they go up, but over time, they go up more than they go down. Yeah, and I mean, it feels like they've been doing nothing but go up for a really long time. So, this is sort of a nice reminder that they do indeed go down and life indeed does go on. Um, I think, honestly, we were talking about this earlier this morning. I think that uh, one of the biggest benefits from coming out of the financial crisis. If you were an investor and you went through the financial crisis, then this is the kind of thing where you can just brush right off your shoulder and just keep on moving along because you understand what's at stake here. I mean, this is why we invest the way we do because you can't predict when stuff is going to happen. Uh it, there's not necessarily a uh, a rationale for what happened, but it does happen, and you need to be able to maintain your composure. Understand that you're going to have some some bumpy rides along the way, but but again, when you look at that five, ten, fifteen, twenty year time horizon, I mean, the market clearly trends in one direction, and it's not down. But that's the thing, David. I mean, there are a lot of investors who really just started in the last seven, eight years or so, so they've never dealt with something like this. Yeah, this week is a helpful reminder that stocks do indeed sometimes go down. <laughs> and but but at the same time, you do have to take a step back and keep this in perspective because the S and P 500 has just fallen back to where it was in July a few months ago. So even though obviously that it hurts to see your money go down more than it. Feels good to see your money go up. Uh, we, we tend to react in a sharper way to pain rather than the joy of gain. So it's really just this comes down to the psychology of investing. Um, but when you can keep that long term time horizon in mind, just remember that the longer you hold, the higher your odds of success over time. There's never been a 20 year stretch with S&P 500 where you actually would have lost money. Uh, and that's going through the Great Depression, the Great Recession, multiple wars, and all sorts of other macro events and worries. So the longer you can uh, hold your stocks and the, the wider your time horizon, the better off you'll be as an investor. But it doesn't take away the pain that you see in a week like this. But I think you, uh, w with that kind of perspective, you treat a drop, like we've seen this week, as more of an opportunity rather than something to fear. And I think it's also important to note that the stocks that have been the highest flyers are the stocks that are have come down the most and actually have a bigger impact on the S and P 500 because of how much they've grown. And I'm thinking largely about the the tech stocks, the stocks that are, you'll often hear called momentum stocks. And by the way, if you buy a momentum stock, you better understand that momentum goes both ways. <laughs> so what goes up does come down. Common, you know, physics tells us that. Um, hopefully, they go up more than they go down. But when these stocks uh, that have been on a tear come down, they come down rather severely. That can create an opportunity to pick up shares as they get cheaper, um, if you have the stomach for the volatility. Um, sometimes I see people jumping in a little too soon. You know, they see one day a, a company drop two percent, and they say, "Oh, time to get in." Well, two percent <laughs> in, in the scheme of things, when a stock is up hundreds of percent, point <laughs> is nothing. Um, but it is. It's important to see what pockets of, of the, the market are really bringing bringing the market as a whole down. Yeah, I think it's really easy to get into a situation like this and get nervous. Uh, particularly if you if you're a relatively new investor, um, we like to quote 
Warren Buffett all the time here. There is one one quote where I'm going to push back on him a little bit because you know he he said something to the extent of diversification is for people who don't know what they're doing or something to that effect. And I get what he's saying there. He's like, if you know what you're doing, then really you can go ahead and concentrate your bets and feel good about how you're investing. Uh, I think for the most part, people need to focus on uh, diversification. I think this is a great example of a time where diversification can help combat the emotions that you likely feel in volatile times like these. I mean, we invest a certain way, obviously, long term in mind. We have a lot of those growth names in our portfolio, okay? And a lot of that growth has been pulled forward in these valuations today. So to see them take a hit is not surprising. But if you have some nice, staid dividend aristocrats, for example, in your portfolio to help counter uh, those high growth names, then this volatility becomes a lot easier to stomach. Well, that was one of the things we talked about last week, Ron, was we're seeing interest rates going up. We're seeing ten-year Treasuries at a seven-year high. And uh, you know, another thing we talked about this morning was just sort of the speed. I mean, that's it's not just that the market is going down; is it is the speed with which we're seeing these drops. And I have to believe that at least part of this is that rise in interest rates and the relative attractiveness of stocks going down ever so slightly. For sure, interest rates are a very, very big part of this. And not only do higher interest rates make borrowing costs for companies higher, which lends to them having declining profits as a result of increasing costs, but higher interest rates create alternative investments um, that make the stock market perhaps less attractive than it looked when interest rates were low. You could, if you can earn three percent at a risk-free ten-year U.S. Treasury. Maybe you don't want to own a 2% dividend stock, unless, of course, you think there's appreciation potential on top of that to be had. But you start to, to think about it a little bit and do the math, and certain a subset, certainly a subset of investors say, I'll take the 3 to 3.5% kind of safe money. Yeah, I think rising interest rates impact shorter term investors or traders more than it impacts uh, fools like us who have a long term time horizon. Like, we're often investing with the intent to hold these companies for at least five years, and ideally you have 10, 20, 30 years. And in the grand scheme of things, they're where interest rates go from one quarter to another, one year to another, probably doesn't matter as much when you're thinking in terms of decades, not quarters or years. Uh, but at the same time, you're seeing all the talking heads on CNBC and, and TV who do often have a shorter term time horizon. That's all they talk about. Uh, so you can't just ignore it, but keep that uh, longer term picture in perspective. And I think the interest rates turn out to be more noise when it comes to the individual companies in your portfolio. And just to double down on something that Jason mentioned about diversity. Diversification. You just have to remember that the volatility that we've seen this week uh, is the norm, not the exception, when it comes to the stock market. So, build your portfolio accordingly. Position your portfolio in such a way that you can kind of ignore this inevitable short-term volatility as best you can, and keep that long-term time horizon in mind. For some people, that might mean having a little bit more cash on the side to take advantage of market declines like this. It might mean diversifying into some more stable companies, like Jason mentioned. But whatever it is, you want to build your portfolio in such a way that you see this inevitable volatility as an opportunity, not something to worry about. And I'll just add, during times like this, you often hear criticism of the Fed um, being too tight on monetary policy or, or, or wherever. There Always to blame. Um, I would recommend to foolish investors to turn that conversation off in your head. Focus on the companies you own, the companies that you think are great for the next five and ten years. Let the Fed do whatever the Fed is going to do. It's out of your control anyway. Just stay as a long term investor. It's kind of laughable when you consider that a few years ago the Fed was being criticized for cutting rates. Right, right. And <laughs> they can't win. It's a, it's a miserable job. Yeah, I'm sorry. You can't have it both ways. Right. Uh, you, you can't say the economy is the strongest it's ever been. and then in the next breath say, uh, but please don't raise interest rates a quarter percent because we're so fragile, we'll, we'll <laughs> just be destroyed. Yeah. Um, I should point out that we are taping this in the middle of the trading day on Friday. So, while the market was up in the morning, who knows where it'll end up. Uh, so, fingers crossed it ends in the green. But let's just go around the table, because one of the things that we talked about in our planning meeting this morning was 
we were kind of hoping to see a little bit more of this, and who knows, depending on how next week goes, maybe we'll get more of that. We're looking for opportunities, particularly if you've got a little cash on the sidelines, if you've got a watch list. And by the way, this is why we do stocks on our radar. This is why we have a watch list. So, Ron, I'll just start with you. What's a company that you've got your eye on that if it fell 20% next week, you wouldn't be too upset? Yeah, people think we're disingenuous when we say we wish the stock market would have kept going down, but but it really is true. You know, I've had a lot of cash on the sidelines waiting for opportunities like this, and I'm under allocated in some of those high tech stocks I mentioned earlier, and I'd love to get in on them at cheaper prices. Twenty percent lower would be awesome. So a company like Twilio, T W L O, uh, they make applications that arm developers um, with the tools to embed communications like text, voice, and video. So like the WhatsApp app of Facebook um, uses Twilio's um, applications. I'd love to be an owner of that stock, but but at the right price. Jason? Yeah, it was an easy one for me. I'm already an owner of IDEX Laboratories, particularly there's IDXX, but uh, I would certainly love to pick up some more shares at a cheaper price. IDEX is the uh, market leader in the pet diagnostics equipment and testing market, so they get a lot of those big razors, the, uh, the equipment, into veterinarians' offices, and then they sell them those blades, the consumables, uh, in the form of those diagnostic uh, tests and whatnot. I have a veterinarian that uses all of their stuff, swears by it, and and my three dogs at home seem to be very happy and healthy, Chris. So I'm going to take his word for it. David, I'm looking at Match Group, kind of in a similar boat to to Ron here. This has been a high flyer. It's been an incredible stock, uh, but still trading for close to 40 times forward earnings. But this is a company behind a portfolio of dating sites and apps like Tinder and its namesake Match. This is really getting to be a business that's printing uh, cash, free cash flow has uh, more than doubled over the past four years, expanding globally. They have a subscription model that they're rolling out with Tinder that seems to be. Uh, doing really well so far, finding ways to increase user engagement both in North America and around the world. So that, that's what I'm keeping an eye on. And I'll just add the first thing I did when the market started turning south is I checked our internal system to see if I was clear to buy the S and P 500 and the Russell 2000. Nothing wrong with buying an ETF, a broad-based index. Uh, with a nod towards a theme we've talked about for a while now, the war on cash. I will simply say that. I would not at all be upset if Visa and MasterCard had yeah. really bad weeks. <laughs> That's good options. Week. Shares of Square fell more than 20% this week. Some of that was the market, Jason. Some of it was also due to Sarah Fryer, who is the CFO at Square. She announced she is leaving at the end of the year. Yeah, you know, I was, I was on, uh, I'm in communication with the investor relations department at Square. I was trying to work out an interview with Sarah, uh, and they were like, you know, she may be a little bit busy. Well, now I get it. <laughs> She's um, very busy. <laughs> it's. Uh, yeah, there was a bit of a one-two punch there. I mean, you understand when when the market pulls back, a stock like Square is going to pull back even more because there's been a lot of growth priced into that stock price. Losing Sarah Fryer is not good. I mean, you can't sit there and cupcake it. She really is the most uh, public face for the company. I think even more so than Jack Dorsey. But I think it's important to really recognize what Square is. Uh, it's not just about cheap swipe fees for small businesses around the country and really around around the world. Uh, you've got Square Capital, you've got the Cash App, and all of this other software that they're building out and offering for retail and restaurants and whatnot. So this becomes really, I know we use this word a lot, but it works here as an ecosystem. Um, and it matters because as you get these merchants using this Square hardware and software, you see some switching costs start to develop there. And I think that they are in the middle of really growing out something special here. And I think if you look at Square, where they are today versus where PayPal is today, through the second quarter of this year, uh, the gross payments volume that has traveled through Square's networks is just under $40 billion. That same number, the, the, the gross payments volume that's traveled through PayPal's network, is close to $275 billion. So, that gives you a very good idea of the opportunity that's in front of Square. There's plenty of growth to be had there. And, and we also know with PayPal's business model, there's a good blueprint there uh, as to how profitable Square can be if they keep doing what they're doing. So, my, my guess is that Jack is going to be very thoughtful in how he fills this role uh, to make Make sure that he gets someone in there to keep this company on the path that they're on. No doubt, these are big shoes to fill. She's done an incredible job since she joined Square, I think, six years ago, in 2012. And I think there will be more scrutiny from uh, investors in Wall Street on how Square goes about this, finding a replacement for her. Because 
still Jack Dorsey is CEO at Twitter and Square. And Sarah, like Jason mentioned, has really been the public face of Square and almost operating more as a co-CEO alongside Dorsey. So, who who they find to replace her will uh, be important. You had me at cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> Sears falling again this week on reports that the company is preparing to file for bankruptcy as early as this weekend. Uh, Ron Sears is working on some financing deals that could potentially keep them open through Christmas. Here we go. Finally, right? <laughs> it's uh, I think it's to liquidate or not to liquidate. That's the question. Chapter eleven reorganization or chapter seven liquidation? I think. Um, Lampert wants to keep this afloat. He wants to get some interim financing to make it through Christmas. He wants to shut a bunch of stores. He wants to try to reorganize this thing um, to keep it going. I'm not sure the banks agree. Um, it might be time to, for them to take whatever they can get um, in liquidation and, and just go home. Well, I mean, if you're the ba- who's lending them money at this point <laughs> with the way that Eddie Lampert has run that company for the past? However many years, you know, reports are that Bank of America and Wells Fargo are in talks with them for emergency financing. That doesn't necessarily mean long-term financing. They do have 134 million dollars of loans coming due. I want to say on Monday, so that's when we actually could see the bankruptcy bankruptcy filing. So, are Walmart and Target sort of the uh, the slight beneficiaries of Sears if they liquidate? I guess so, but I think they've been benefiting all along from the, the, the slow demise. <laughs> Our email address is radio at fool.com. Question from Philip Green, who writes There's been a lot of talk about investments being made in cannabis companies from outside the industry. Do you think tobacco companies are looking at cannabis legalization as a strategic opportunity? Seems to me that there would be fewer logistical hurdles on the part of these companies that already grow and distribute a variety of leafy products. David, what do you think? Philip called it. Uh, th- this week, it was rumored that Altria uh, is rumored to be looking to invest in a Canadian cannabis producer. Uh, Afria is the name that keeps coming up uh, as far as the producer they're looking at within Canada. I think the biggest question here is, why did it take so long? Because it's been almost a year since Constellation Brands first invested in Canopy Growth, and they re-upped that investment in a huge way in August. And, And along the way, you have more and more of these multinational companies getting more comfortable, I think, with the legal framework of um, the legal cannabis industry in Canada and elsewhere. So, you have Coca-Cola, Diageo, PepsiCo, all mentioning that you know, they're sort of at least keeping an eye on it, exploring potential uh, partnerships with cannabis companies in Canada. But I think this is a testament to the fact that these companies are getting more comfortable with the idea that the U.S. federal government won't intervene with these kind of deals. So far, Constellation Brands hasn't dealt with really any legal headwinds, at least from the U.S. government. So, it's probably uh, an indication that these companies expect full federal legalization of cannabis to happen in the U.S. sooner than later. Yeah, if you're on the board of directors at Altria and you see Coca-Cola and Pepsi are kicking the tires on this industry, yeah, you have to be wondering why you're not. Yeah, and you also have to take a step back and realize that per capita cigarette consumption, at least in the U.S., has been cut in half since 2000, so there are clearly headwinds when it comes to tobacco use, but cannabis is potentially a healthier alternative to get a similar high and you know kind of fill the gap that um, is being lost with cigarettes. We got a little bit of time. Let's dip back into the fool mailbag. Radio at fool.com is our email address from John Sheffield. I listen to your Market Foolery podcast every morning while getting ready for work. Thanks, John. We Absolutely. Appreciate Love it. it. He didn't have a question. I just <laughs> no, no. Uh, He goes on to write, My family bought me shares of Coca-Cola when I was about six months old, set it to reinvest, and left it there. I moved it to my own trading account a few years ago, and now, at 23 years old, it has grown to quite a large position. I've been investing for a few years now with my own money, but I've never known what to do with this massive position because that has a very low cost basis. Do I sell some of it down and put it to work somewhere else? Do I let it sit and continue to reinvest? There's not a ton of growth opportunity, but Coca-Cola pays a nice dividend every quarter. Thanks, and keep up the great work. First of all, John should be taking his family out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, but you know, we get a version of this question from time to time. We love to see this, but it, it it's a nice problem to have, Ron. But it's still a problem. It's still a problem, and it's a problem for a financial planner. But I'll take a shot at it. Um, if it, if if it's too big a portion of your portfolio, and it probably is at 23 years old. Um, 
it probably is wise to sell some of it down as you get older and put it to work in other things. It doesn't have to be done immediately. There's no rush. Coca-Cola is not going anywhere. As he mentions, it pays a nice dividend. Cap gains tax rate fifteen percent, not too bad, not too punitive. You can take it and put it, you know, somewhere else where that'll earn you more money, hopefully, than you're going to pay in taxes. Um, eventually, one day, you know, you could you could let your heirs take that stock, and the the cost basis will step up, and there'll be no taxes associated with it. But at twenty three years old, you're probably not thinking about your heirs that much. Yeah, Coca Cola is certainly probably going to be. Continue to be one of the more stable companies you can invest in. It's not going to be a high flyer, but you like uh, like John said, you get the reliable dividends. So I think part of it is how confident are you in Coca Cola shares five plus years from now. But in the meantime, I agree with Ron. It can't hurt to sell bits and pieces, sell in stages as you have other ideas that you want to diversify into. And quickly, I would say don't reinvest the dividends. Take the dividends in cash and put them to work in something else rather than accumulate more Coke. All right, let's get to the stocks on our radar and our man behind the glass. Steve Broyden is going to hit you with a question. Ron Gross, you're up first. What are you looking at this week? I got a radar stock, not a recommendation yet. Boston Omaha, B O M N. It's a small cap stock, only about $600 million market cap, under the radar, early stage conglomerate, which is funny, early stage conglomerate. But <laughs> they invest in businesses with attractive economics, mostly right now in outdoor advertising, a la billboards, and surety bonds insurance. Um, they also hold some home building real estate services and some other things too really strong leadership two investment guys right now they're only taking minimum wage as a salary until they can grow this thing so I really like kind of how they're aligning themselves with uh, shareholders Steve question about Boston Omaha um, what's the most uh, memorable billboard you can remember Ron <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think uh, on the way to Vegas, there are some very interesting va- va- <laughs> billboards that you see as you get closer to the Strip. Jason Moser, what are you looking at this week? Uh, taking a look at a new IPO, a recent IPO here called Eventbrite, ticker is EB. Uh, as I said, they just went public, so there isn't a whole heck of a lot of information out there beyond the S1. Uh, but this is a tech platform uh, in the form of an app and also a desktop. But ultimately, they have the components uh, for individuals and groups to plan, promote, Produce live events, and uh, this this helps them do that without having to go to a number of different providers. Uh, it helps drive ticket sales, and that's ultimately how they make their money is by getting the fees from these ticket sales. Uh, the interesting thing about this company management it's led by a husband and wife team of Kevin and Julia Hartz. And if Kevin Hartz sounds familiar, Chris, well, Kevin Hartz was also behind the founding of Zoom, which is a uh, company that. Was recently acquired by PayPal, and you know I liked it a lot. You were very bitter about that acquisition. I was a little bitter. You you wanted Zoom to be a standalone public company. Still harboring a little bit of it too. Steve, question about Eventbrite? Sure. With all the video streaming that's going on in this world today, uh, do you worry about that uh, kind of taking a hit at Eventbrite? Well, I think that's an opportunity potentially to leverage what they're doing with partners, whether it's Live Nation or we've seen Live Nation with Twitter, for example, start offering some video streaming there. So I think there are a lot of different ways they can leverage that content with social partners uh, to be. To get that out to, to bigger audiences, David, what are you looking at? I'm looking at Vale Resorts, ticker MTN. I believe this was Maddie's radar stock last week, so I'm uh, double dipping here. But this is the company behind ski resorts, and this they're, they're increasingly diversified across um, different seasons, so summer and winter, and geographies around the world. Uh, dividend yield at an all time high, 24 times free cash flow. Taking a look, Steve. How do I know when I'm ready for the black diamond? Oh, gosh. Uh, don't ask me, Steve. That's the answer. <laughs> what do you want to add to your watch list, Steve? Eventbrite sounds pretty cool. Yeah! All right. Jason Moser, David Kretzman, Ron Gross. Guys, thanks for being here. Thanks, thanks Chris. Chris. That's going to do it for this week's edition of Motley Fool Money. Our engineer is Steve Broido. Our producer is Matt Greer. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Yeah.